So today what we're going to discuss is how I signed to my favorite record label. And then I'm going to walk you through one of the tracks from that EP. Hey guys, Dilby here. Welcome back to the channel. So Fresh Off The Press just released as my latest EP on 8-Bit Records, one of my favorite record labels. It's got the track Reaction Time, which I'm going to show you today, as well as another track Wilderness, which is a collaboration with an amazing Canadian artist called Oliver Wickham. He's an amazingly talented producer and vocalist, so I'll link his Instagram down below so you can go check him out. He releases on Injuna Deep, amongst other awesome labels. And there's also an amazing remix from Nick Curley, who runs the label together with Gorge. Just quickly, I need your help. My Instagram's been hacked. I've tried to regain access, but the process is not working for me. If you know anyone at Facebook that can help, please reach out to me in the email below in the description. Anyway, on with the story. How did I get signed to my favorite record label, 8-Bit Records? Well, it wasn't easy. I've been trying to do that for years. <laughs> This is actually my third release with them now, but I've been sending them music for five or six years before that. And pretty much every time Gorge or Nick Curley comes to play in Berlin, I'm there. I'm going to meet them, I'm going to talk to them, I'm talking to them on Instagram, I'm building a relationship so that when I send a demo to them, even if they don't like the music, they know it's from, they know me, they know what I'm about. It doesn't give any guarantees that they're gonna like the music or want to sign it, but if they're familiar with me, it means that at least they're probably gonna check it out. Sending music, to demos at email addresses can be a pretty fruitless endeavor. Most labels, even really small labels, are receiving like hundreds and thousands of demos. And that's just a fact. So the best thing you can do to stand out from the pack is actually get to know the people behind the label somehow. And we all have the same opportunity to do that with social media, except me, because my Instagram's been hacked. <laughs> So if you've got a label that you dream about signing to, get involved. Go to the shows, talk to the artists, comment on their Instagram posts. Don't spam them with links to your demos. Like, try to build a relationship and then ask them if they'd be interested in hearing something and what's the best way to get that to them. This means they're gonna be expecting it and there's a much higher likelihood that they're gonna actually listen to it. So if there's a label that you really wanna sign with, you can get started on the process now. You don't actually have to have the tracks to send them. You can start building the relationship. And speaking of building relationships, if you wanna get more involved with the community here, then jump over to Patreon. There's a link in the description. Patreon's one of the best ways that you can support the channel and make sure I keep bringing you these videos every week. And you can download all the project files from the tutorials that I do on the channel. There's so much material there. All right, let's just jump into Ableton and see how I put this track together. All right, so here we are inside Ableton, and this is the project for Reaction Time, out now on 8-bit. So let's just jump straight in. We're at 125 BPM, which I think is a pretty good tempo for this. The vocal was the first thing that I found on this track. I was just listening through stuff on Splice or Loop Cloud, I don't recall. But basically I found the sample, and I was like, I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna make a track around this. So that's where it all started. And this is how I like to work. I generally come into the studio with an idea, whether that's like a melody, whether it's to work on a short sketch that I've done previously, a sample I've found, some source of inspiration and a game plan. That's how I work best. By having one of the key elements when I started, it allows me to kind of build a track around that key element and add layers to the track that help to support and emphasize that key element, which allows the track to be relatively simple and not too overcrowded with a very strong theme. So you can see here we've got 43 tracks, but that's including a bunch of groups and buses and things. So there's not so many elements in this track. If you look back at my walkthrough of Remember Me, for example, that had a lot more stuff. There's a lot more little details and things in there. This is quite a bit more straightforward. Although when it comes to the melodic elements, there's still a bit going on, but we'll get to that. So let's just start at the start with the drums. We're gonna take a listen to the kick. Nice, solid, housey kick. It's got like a nice tone to it, and I've tuned it to the key of the track. The track is in D minor, and we can see this is hitting at G, so it's the perfect fifth. It's always gonna sound. I've got a little bit of processing here. I'm just rolling off a little bit of the sub, but I've also got this standard clip. So that is a soft clipper. You can see that red there, that's indicating that it's chopping the top off that kick drum. So why am I doing that? Well, let me show you. I'll turn it off. Pretty much sounds the same, right? It's not really adding any volume, but this kick has a really sharp transient on it. The reason I'm doing this is to manage the limiter. If I've got a really sharp, loud transient that is hitting the limiter, 
then it's going to trigger the limiter. The limiter reacts to peak volume. So what I'm doing is just managing the peak volume of that sample. If it has the loud transient, when that loud transient comes through, the limiter is going to clamp down on the full track. And I don't want that to happen. So this way, the full track doesn't get compressed. It just kind of shaves off the top of that transient. And as you can see, when I turn it on and off, it's pretty much inaudible. Win. Let's go to the claps. Very simple stuff. I've got this clap from a top loop. Now when we look at it, what I've done is I've taken the top loop and I think I've split out the clap and the hats so that I can process them separately and adjust the volumes individually because loops are great, but they're not always mixed well, right? So if I look at this top loop, I've got the hats at minus six and I've got the claps at minus 11, right? So I really wanted to bring those claps down. Click on the hats there so you can see that's how the hats are. Cool. Now well, I've got a LFO tool here, which looks like it's ducking the clap. So that's kind of turning down the clap even more. So why am I doing that? Well, I've got another clap, so I don't want too much volume on either of them. I want them to work well together, right? But there are some other elements in this loop, like we've got this kind of crunchy hit on the downbeat, right? It's giving, giving like a real nice crispy vibe to the drums. And then obviously we've got the snare here, right? So I'm using that LFO tool to just duck the clap a bit. Now I've got another clap from East End Dubs, Single Hits, such a good pack. I've mentioned it on the channel a few times. And you can hear this is so contrasting to the other clap. It's like sharper and cleaner sounding. The other one's like really crusty, distorted sounding, saturated. And that's to create contrast. If I just throw on another clap that sounds like this, then it's essentially just like turning up the volume. But when I play them together, They're sitting nicely. They're adding to each other and kind of creating something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. So I've got a bit of processing on here. I'm just cutting out the lows. I don't need it. It's the clap's happening on top of the kick. So any kind of sub frequencies are just absolutely unneeded. I've got this delay, which is set to like a Haas effect widening thing. So the right side is delayed by 10 milliseconds from the left side. And this gives the illusion of the sound being wide. Then I've got a bit of reverb on this. This clap, I didn't need any reverb as it's already got some on the sample. But this one's very dry, so I did want to add, add a bit more reverb to it. Now you can hear that along with the kick. Really nice solid backbone for the track. Now we talked about this loop before, so I'll just add that into the mix. Now really important here, you notice that I'm not actually cutting out that much low end, you know, there's still plenty of body in these hats and this allows me to not have too much going on. It sounds full. When I'm mixing stuff for clients, a lot of the time I'll get tracks that have a whole bunch of top loops and hi-hat loops all cut really high. It just creates a real brittle sound for the track. In my experience, finding the right sound that fits well in the track is much more beneficial and makes everything, especially mixing, so much easier. So... Ah, let me just see here. Okay, so this is the loop before I've consolidated it. To get the claps only, all I would have done is use the envelope like this, then put in some fades, just so we're not getting any clipping. You know, maybe bring this out a little bit. Actually, that's probably even enough. Then I can just duplicate that along the whole thing. And then I've consolidated it so that whatever, I don't lose it. But editing your loops with the envelope tool is really handy. I recommend you doing it. Kind of just personalizes them a bit, allows you to control the dynamics of them. Got this closed hat. Simple stuff. It's just taken from a loop there. And I've got a vocoder on it. So this is working like an effect sound, right? Show automation. So it only happens once, but it's building up to the drop. So you see there's not that many effects in this track and I've done that on purpose. So instead of adding like effects, rises and things, I'm using the elements of the track 
to create the same effect, the same kind of build up and tension. But because they're coming from elements in the track, it just sounds a whole lot more organic and cohesive. And I've got this Stereo Savage plugin. Just creating a bit of width. This plugin's a bit of a nightmare for phase cancellation. If I take a utility, put it here, mono it. You can hear we're actually losing a bit of volume when I mono it. But this isn't such an important element, so I'm not too worried about it. If it was like the main hi-hat, then it would be a different story. So Stereo Savage is a cool plugin, but it does definitely cause issues with your phase cancellation. So use it sparingly and only use it on elements where you don't really mind if it gets lost in the cancellation. But always do check your tracks in mono. Okay, tambourine. Simple stuff. I've just got a I've just got an auto pan on that, which is automating it across the panorama. And you can see here I've got a little bit of volume automation on the EQ. So I'm just as we go into the break, I'm just pulling that down. Could be done with volume, but this just feels a bit more organic. So let's just hit the drums and the kick. So a really clean beat, not too much going on, plenty of space, but it's got the kind of vibe and attitude that I want. Now I'll just add in this ride. Pretty much doing the exact same thing as the tambourine. I've just literally put them in there alternating so that it just switches things up and has a bit of differentiation. But essentially it's just adding more to the highs and the panorama, which just adds energy to the track. Now I've got this percussion loop. Let me just solo that. Right, so you can see a couple of things here on the EQ. I've got some gain automation. So I'm just bringing that in at the start. And I've got a high cut on here, right? So it sounds like this might be a top loop or something. Right, so it's got a pretty strong hi-hat in there, which has actually got some pretty harsh peaks on it. But I was just really interested in that percussion groove. And as it's kind of just a rolling groove that's going throughout the track, not too, not too prominent, it didn't really bother me. I do lose a little bit of the kind of punch of the percussion, but it doesn't really matter. It just rolls along in the background. Nice solid backbone to the track, right? With the percussion loop, I've pitched it up two semitones so that those conga loops are in the scale of the track. And it just helps everything to sound a bit more harmonious together. You can hear there when it's pitched up, it just sounds a lot more harmonious and works together with the rest of the beat, especially because the kick is tuned to the key of the track. Now let's have a look at the bass line. Now this sounds quite a lot more complex than it is. If I just play it with the kick. Really driving, energetic groove, and it sounds quite interesting. It sounds like there's a lot going on, but it's actually really simple. So I've got a patch from Trillion, Dark Round Voyager, done a little bit of tweaking, but it's essentially like it is out of the box. I've turned on the sub oscillator. I use this in so many tracks, honestly. It's pretty nondescript, but it just fills out that bottom end and does what I need. So this MIDI is super simple, right? It's just playing on the offbeat here and then on the 16th here. So I'll turn off that one. Sounds a lot more boring than before, right? So let's have a look at what we've got going on. I've got this erosion, which is what's giving it that kind of bit crushed vibe. If you're familiar with my tracks, you'll probably recognize that bass. It's in literally so many. Then I've got a bit of delay coming from Replica XT from Native Instruments. I love this delay. My favorite thing about it is this under panning here. It's got the left and right offset. So it's just a straight delay, not ping pong, but it sounds stereo. It's so good. Uh, I'm cutting out the subs on that and cutting down some of the highs just so that the delays are a bit separated from the original sound. 
I've got this rack here, which is just cutting out the subs in some of these places. Normally I would do this, chop that, and just color it differently so that I can see visually what's going on, but I haven't here. Looks like I tried a different delay, but went with the Native Instruments one. So simple stuff on the bass line there. Now let's have a look at the sub one. Here's the MIDI. Again, really simple, right? So this is from a loop, it's just one hit, and I've just pitched it to be in the key of the track. Uh, this is playing D, which is D minor is the key of the track. Got a decapitator on there. As I've pitched it down quite a bit, I think I probably added the decapitator to give a bit more harmonics to the track, to the sound. And then again, because it's being pitched down, it brings in a lot more subharmonics, right? So if I turn that back to zero, so I'm just cutting out some of those subharmonics. I want this bass line to be doing the main sub, and then this one is creating like a supporting groove. Really cool in live, what we can do is if we select both of these, it'll show them together. Let me zoom in here, and we can see it over a couple of bars. So that's what the pattern is doing. What I could do here is try it, turn that on, and then duplicate this, and then add another note here. Maybe I'll just bring that down, bring that down in velocity a little, and where was the other one? There, right. So now what I've done is just put this bass line over one sound. Right, so if we listen now, it's just, it's not going to play this sub hit. Now if we play here. You can hear it sounds so much more interesting when it's split over two sounds. It's no more complicated. I've just taken the same bass line and split it. Let's listen closer with the kick and the bass. You can hear there's so much more texture and interest going on with the second version. So this is like a really, really cool tip that you can implement super easily just to make your bass lines have a lot more dynamics and depth. So this is like the foundation of the track. This is what we're working with. Sounds like there's quite a lot more going on than just those few elements that I've shown you. I think the key takeaway here is less is more, but they need to, the elements need to be right in order to work. There's nowhere for anything to hide. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the vocal before we move on to the melodic elements, as that was the starting point for the track. We live as one Two's forever, babe you like the sun Burning bright as day So that's the vocal. So I found the vocal in a drum and bass pack, I believe. And I think that can be like a really helpful tip for digging for samples. If you start looking in the same places under house, deep house, melodic techno, tech house, whatever, that's where everyone else is looking, right? But if you're looking in like world or drum and bass or reggaeton or whatever, like then it's much more likely that you're going to find something that's a bit more unique. It may take a bit more work to get it to sit in the track. I guess this was like 140 BPM or something. Uh, it says 128. Okay, but I do remember it came from a drum and bass pack, so not sure what's going on there. Anyway, so these vocals are grouped and processed together. They're kind of part, they're phrases of the same thing, so I didn't feel there was any need to process them individually. I can process them as one group. So we've got a virtual mix rack, which is just doing some saturation, a bit of compression, a bit of EQ, not much, a little bit more saturation, or it's kind of like a harmonic exciter, I guess. We've got a de We live as one, two's forever, babe. Does what it says on the tin. I've got a delay, which is just a ping pong dotted eighth notes. And I'm using the EQ on the delay to filter out some unwanted frequencies and separate the delay from the original source sound. We live as one. And then I've got a bit of reverb. This is just a preset from Slate Digital, Verb Suite Classics, called Vocal Heaven. And I've just mixed that into taste. So without the processing, we live as one 
tattoos forever, babe. So you can hear it's got a little bit of effects on it, but you know, this is kind of a deep, vibey track. I want it to be a bit more epic, right? I'll turn this stuff off, and we can just hear what the virtual mix rack is doing. We live as one. Tattoos forever, babe. So you can hear that it's adding a bit of volume. I've tried to counteract that with the trimmer on the end, which is just a gain, but it is pushing the vocal a lot more in front, giving it a bit more crunch and presence. So as the vocal's only happening in the break, there's a lot more space for it to be really like in front and really forward. Then what I've got with the vocal is this reverse. So I've created that myself. You can see here, I've just taken a piece of the piece of this, added a reverb with a long decay time and frozen it. Then I take that, I could just do it like this, grab it here, pull it down. And then it looks like I went like that. Go crop and reverse. And that's what we got. Then I'm just sending that to a bit of reverb to, so that it doesn't stop suddenly because I'm using it as a kind of effects sweep. The main vocal is only playing in the breaks, but having this sweep allows to kind of have some vocal atmosphere throughout the rest of the track. And like I said earlier, having effects sounds that are taken from elements of the track just helps everything to feel nice and kind of like it's meant to be there. So let's have a look at the effects. Got three things, a fill, four things, sorry, fill. Got another fill here, which looks like it's playing together. Sounds a bit chaotic like that, but let's just have a listen in context. Cool. I've got this impact, it says crash effects on it. So that's exactly what it says. Nice big washy sound there. And then I've got this reverse. So really minimal effects on this. So finally, let's have a look at the melodic group. And I save this to last because there's quite a lot going on, but it's not actually that complicated and it's all there to back up the vocal and the theme of the track. So let's just turn all, everything off and we can kind of add them one by one. So I've got this bright chord sound. Kind of like a signature sound that I use in a lot of tracks. This is made from my Behringer Model D. I made the track in February. It was really cold here in Berlin. So I was trying to kind of have my hardware and stuff turned on to actually heat up the studio a bit. Right now it's super hot and I've got all my hardware pretty much unplugged. But you really don't need hardware to make this sound. It's super simple. So I've just recorded a few takes and then I've looped it. You know, normally you'd kind of loop something over four bars like that or something. I've looped it over six bars and you can see there it's kind of changing throughout the track. I could also loop it over five bars and then it would change less consistently. Even though there's only a few different recordings there, by looping it over a non-standard loop length, it allows it to kind of change in a way that the listener doesn't expect. So it sounds like it's evolving more than it is or changing more than it is. Let's have a look at the processing on that. So I've got this auto filter. Turn this off. Auto filter. You can see I've got a bit of LFO on this, which basically means this, this is just sweeping up and down at a rate that's determined 0.11 hertz. Got a bit of drive here set to the MS20 algorithm. The filter just helps to kind of sit it in the background and having the LFO means that there's another thing that's moving so it doesn't sound so repetitive. I've got the, another Replica XT, quarter note delay, ping pong, and then I've got this delay here, which is a dotted eighth note. And also there's a little bit of reverb on that. These are my return tracks. Uh, I'll link a video up here if you want to check out my template, but this is standard in my template. The template's also available to download for patrons, so there's a link in the description to my Patreon. Go over there and grab it if you want. So a really simple, easy to create sound. I think it's just two oscillators, and let's have a look at the notes on Spectrum. 
Yeah. So it's got A and D. So I assume what I did is create one sawtooth and then created another sawtooth layer, which was detuned by five semitones and then just messed around with the settings of the amp and filter envelopes and the feedback and resonance and then just recorded a take where I was kind of changing a couple of parameters to get different sounds out of it. I've got this pad. Nice sound. This comes from a collaboration I did with Simon Matson. So I've just literally grabbed it and used it again in here. It was in a different key, so I've pitched it down. A nice phasey pad to kind of sit in the track, give it a bit of deep vibes. I've added a bit of processing with the pedal. I guess I did that just to sit it in the track. In context, it doesn't sound too different, to be honest. Okay, sequence. So the vocal is kind of the hook of the track, and this, is, I would say, is the second hook. Maybe you could argue the bright chord is a bit. But let's have a listen to this. Yeah, nice. So if I pull this down, you can see here I've got the scale set to D minor in Ableton. And then let's expand it up so you can see it better. And I've got it folded to the scale. So it's only showing notes in the scale. So it makes it super easy to program. You know, I can just click anywhere and these are going to be in the right scale. So you can see here I'm just going up and down octaves in a kind of polyrhythm pattern. Pretty simple. And then I guess I've just taken that, duplicated it, and then kind of created some differentiation. That's pretty much the way I work. Let's have a look at the clip view, and we can see, okay, this is how it kind of started. There you go, pretty much exactly as I was saying, right? So exactly as I said, I've kind of taken an idea and expanded upon it. And that's basically how I come up with my melodies. I kind of start simple and start trying to expand and make them more detailed and complicated until I have something that I like. And by that process, I do it very quickly. And I just kind of duplicate it, add some more, duplicate it, add some more, duplicate it, add some more. And the reason I do the duplication is so that I don't lose anything. And that allows me to be more creative and move more quickly because I'm not worried that I'm going to lose what I had before because it's all, it's all saved there. Then what I can do is once I've got a bunch of ideas, I can just play them along with the track and kind of audition which one sounds good. So let's have a look at the patch. It's coming from Diva. You can see here that it's a knit mini poly. So that's one of the initialized templates. So that's supposed to emulate a polyphonic mini Moog. And what I've done is changed the envelopes from the standard like mini Moog envelopes, which are that to the analog ones as they offer a bit more control. Then I just mess around. This looks like it's pretty similar to what I was explaining for the pluck sound, just maybe of an extra oscillator, maybe playing in a different octave, but really simple stuff. Easy to create the sound, just making small tweaks. Like it looks like I've add some, added some FM here to the filter, but yeah, really easy and simple. These kind of like detuned sawtooths are the foundation to a lot of sounds that you might want to make. I'm not some kind of sound design wizard, but I've learned how to make some sounds that I like, and I've realized that a lot of sounds are based on the same kind of techniques. So I've got a bunch of automation here, filter frequency, resonance, envelope, depth, and release. So that's what we could hear before with the release. It's kind of going a bit crazy. Let's hear this, which is in the break. So it's all building up, right? So you can hear there it's being sent to a big reverb. 
which is what I was talking about before, about kind of creating effects like sounds from the elements that are already in the track. It just sounds really natural and organic. I'm just creating intensity by opening the filter cutoff, extending the release so each of those notes stops being plucky and starts to extend longer. And then as that intensity is building, I want to create contrast on the drop. So I'm filtering out a little bit of the low end of this, just so that the low end's coming out of the track. So when it drops, it's like, bam, the subs explode in the club. In terms of the arrangement for the sound, I really hold it back. I don't introduce it at all until the break. So it comes in and gives a new energy to the track. It's a new thing that kind of takes the forefront of the track and brings it to the next level. Keeps it really interesting. And this is something I always try and do in my tracks. If you listen to some of my tracks, you'll notice that I do this in almost every track. I have some kind of secondary melodic theme. Often it's quite significant or maybe the main melodic theme, but I don't introduce it till later in the track. And doing that allows to create a moment in the track where it comes in and the track goes up a level. All right, we've got a high string. Recording from my JV1010 RIP. Just a simple held string playing on the root note. Now we've got this pluck sound, which is another thing from East End Dubs. I don't recommend things that I don't use. Super simple. Now, I've got this Tel Chorus LX. I'm always going on about this on the channel. I use it in every single project, every track I make. So I've got quite a lot of chorus going on on this. What's happening is it's playing the exact same sound, but each sound is slightly different. Uh, a good way you can see that, if I go here and we look at the mixer, you see it's kind of moving around and that's because of the chorus. If I didn't have the chorus, every one of these plucks would sound exactly the same. Boring as hell, right? I've also got it pitched up, so if it was at its root pitch... It's a bit dull, doesn't fit in the track, so bring it up, turn on the chorus... And turn on the delay, dotted eighth note... It's very subtle. I bring it in early in the intro, just as like a, it's kind of almost like a percussion type sound, just adding another texture to the groove. So it's just, it's working like a rhythmic element, really. It could also be a vocal or something like that. Just having different sounds from different sources helps to add texture to the beat. So phase chord, what are you? Okay, another one shot from East End Dubs. Ooh, that's cool, right? So without the processing... Yeah. So Decapitator adds some harmonics. God Phaser a, is a phaser from D16. Great plugins out of Poland. That really gives it that kind of tremolo, organ-y kind of vibe. And... Chorus. And Delay. Eighth note ping pong. And then I've got an LFO tool on the end, just ducking it to the kick. So if I show you the original sound... So that's what it started life as. And that's what it is now. That's sound design, baby. So it's quite subtle in the track there, just really adding some nice vibe. Okay, now I've got this higher pluck. What's this? Okay, another diva sound. It's a preset from Tim Engelhardt's library from Production Music Live. Super nice library. I generally tweak the presets and kind of rein them in a bit as there's lots of effects and stuff on them, but really, really good pack. So, pretty simple sequence, just adding a bit more kind of vibe. I've taken out some of the notes. What do they do? So just a bit chaotic. This is just happening every two bars, with slight differentiation, relatively random it looks like. Uh, I've got the same motif here, and then I'm just using 
an extra note here to differentiate it. Extend the loop feels like it's going over a longer period of time. So adding these kind of simple motifs with little differences helps to extend the loop and make the track feel less loopy and more like a track. Dub chord, something like this in pretty much every one of my tracks, gives it the kind of deep vibes that I like. So this is just a sample from don't know where, I guess Loop Cloud. So you can hear it's doing like a call and response with the bright chord. Works really well together, I think. So what I've done on that is added my own delay, a lot of delay, and then I'm using LFO tool to duck that out on the kick. But if you look at the sample here, I've pitched it down by five semitones, so this is not in the key that my track is being written in. So it kind of changes the sound and makes it, it's a simple thing, but it makes it more unique to me. I've also edited the clip gain, so it's not playing this extra note. Let me just cut this and delete, and then let's pitch it back up. Let's play it. So it's a cool sound, it works well. You know, someone else could use that exact sound and no one's gonna recognize it from my track. That's how I like to use samples. Deep pad, okay, so it's just another pad sound from the same sample pack. And then I've put it into a simpler and I'm just playing it where I need it. Okay, so it's just extended out. I've looped the sample and that allows it to just sit in the background and maintain that deepness. Nice vibe, really adding that kind of deepness that I like to the track. Let's have a listen here where there's a bit more space. Really adds a nice vibe, right? Okay, we've got atmosphere pads one and two. So what are these? Just another sample, just another sample. So I've got a big delay coming from Sound Toys Effect Rack. So that gives it that kind of dubby vibe that it's got. This is happening on the downbeat every four bars. Just helps to feel like it's turning over, extending the loop out again. Then I've got Atmosphere Pad 2, another loop. Kind of like haunting stuff. I've moved around the start times of the loop so that it fits where I want it to in the track. Let's give it a bit of context. So you can hear that a lot of those pads and atmospheres and things are pretty low in the mix. And I've just added them in to give a bit more depth and emotion to the track. Now let's have a look at these elements, a couple of things that I didn't use. I think that might be from the Gorge and Nick Curley video that I made. I'll link that up here if you want to check it out. But I think it's from that. It didn't end up fitting in the track. Let's have a listen to how it might have sounded. Cool, but I think I was going for something that was a bit more subtle. Then I've got this up. Okay, let's try that. Really not working, really not working with the track. We go to the clip view. We can have a look at what's going on. So I've just got a bunch of different chord sequences to try out different ARPs, I think. But 
in the end it doesn't really fit in the track, so I've turned it off. In the previous iterations of this track, there were probably a bunch of other elements that I tried that didn't make the cut. And I think it's really important to just not be too precious about the elements. Even if you spend a lot of time creating them, be willing to let them go at any moment. You can always use them in another track. You can always kind of find a place for them. And at least you tried. Trying could signify something that doesn't work or spark some inspiration for something that might work. So it's always important to try, but don't be scared to just get rid of them. All right, guys, I hope you like that. I hope you found it useful. I've had so much fun playing this track in the last few months. It's been really destroying it in my DJ sets. Don't forget, if you know anyone on Instagram or Facebook, please reach out. It would mean so much. If you like this style of video, then check out this one where I walk through my recent Deep House number one. Remember me. It's good. <laughs> anyway, that's it from me today. I'll catch you next time. Peace.